think Singapore's story really started when we decided that we wanted to be attractive to multinationals to locate businesses, regional HQs. And there was then a very concerted effort to clean up Singapore, dredge the swamps, improve sanitation, bring in clean, clean drinking water. And while all of these, if we look at the history books, they were primarily aimed at making Singapore a very attractive place to do business. It had a very salubrious effect on basically public health also. And it's, no, and it's no surprise that if we look back over the last 50 years, the leading causes of death and also, and also hospitalization shifted very, very rapidly from the communicable diseases to what we define today as the chronic diseases, cancers and heart diseases and so on. And I think that that was very, very successful. We, we implemented very strong public health programs. The, um, there was tremendous emphasis placed also on vaccines and, and on eradicating vaccine preventable diseases. Right. Subsequently, and as Singapore's public health care infrastructure started to get more and more sophisticated, we then moved into an era from 1970 onwards around medical specialization and with development in the major specialties, cancer, um, the, the well, various surgical disciplines that then also led to a consequent development in also, in, in also infectious disease, uh, not just community-based but also, but also hospital-based. And I think that this put us in very good state when it came to difficult periods such as SARS into, in, in, back in 2003 and some of the preparatory work for H1N1, MERS and so on. We were very fortunate that making Singapore a great place to live and a great place to do business naturally and somewhat automatically meant um, getting rid or really eradicating many of the vector-borne diseases, many of these, of, these, of these infectious diseases. Beyond that, it is actually surprising that Singapore in, in I guess what is a hot spot for all kinds of tropical and various infectious diseases has managed to keep Singapore relatively safe and I think that there must be due credit given to the government officials who have maintained a lot of vigilance in watching the borders and really watching very very closely for any signs of for any signs of outbreaks up and around the region and to assess what does it mean for us uh, really here and I think that that this that this uh, really three-pronged approach of making sure that our, that our basic sanitation and our basic hygiene is of a very, very high standard, firstly. Secondly, making sure that, that, that we practice active surveillance. And thirdly, making sure that we have a very strong network of friends and essentially contacts around the world so that we have as early a warning as is, as is possible so that not just the government, the policy makers, but the, but the various hospitals that are at the front line, the doctors who see patients, they will also be kept, in, kept informed and be ready to look out. Governments or? Um, cleaner government is something very difficult to say in this era, um, but I do think that Singapore's compact size, it has been helpful because uh, there's much greater command and control, but I think that more important than the small size is, is really the political will and the commitment. Um, this is SG50, I think we, we really should look back and I think that, that particularly Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's commitment to a clean and green Singapore was incredibly helpful in really addressing many of, these, many of the uh, threats that arise from the different communicable diseases. Uh, let's look at it um, from a somewhat security point of view. We look at domestic security. I am personally quite discomforted by the fact that doctors have a financial incentive to prescribe the most expensive drugs that tend to be the branded medicines. And and while we don't have good data, the 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 anecdotal sensing is that many doctors prescribe antibiotics and expensive and and, and I guess um, higher end ones that would over time lead to rise in community resistance. And I think that this harms us in the long term, even if short term there are financial benefits for the, for the doctors who are, who are prescribing them. And the patients, um, perhaps due to poor education, also feel better when they are given medicines and specifically the antibiotics 
at the from a more external point of view, Singapore cannot run away from the fact that we are a hub for so many things, logistics, for air travel and really so on. So we just have to live with the with the reality that millions of of people come in and out of Singapore every year and that eternal vigilance is part of Singapore's karma. Right? And I certainly do hope that Singapore continues to invest very strongly in leading edge ID research so that we won't be caught um, we won't be caught on the so called back pedal and when any emerging threats um, are really arise we're in a very strong position to essentially analyze and really react very very strongly. It would be very disappointing if Singapore was the originator, right? Which, if we look at the zoonotic infections that seem to dominate in the current times, this would be unusual. I think the biggest threat facing Singapore would be that we let our guard down and that a new or a novel disease it arises in some other part of the world. It enters into Singapore through our very, very porous borders and we fail to detect and to manage correctly and it then spreads like wildfire throughout Singapore and that I think would be very, very problematic. In fact, it would be devastating. I think All In Singapore has done a remarkably good job but there's so much more complexity today. I certainly do hope that the infectious disease that the infectious diseases community recognises that we are not only um, doctors who are treating individual patients but at the system level, you have a very strong role in advising policymakers, in advocating. Um, it's it's really very challenging to get sufficient funding for the for the epidemic that never happened, for the outbreak that never killed anyone. But I think this is a role that the infectious disease community, the ID physicians, the nurses, will continue to have an ever more important role. And I'm personally very gratified that many of the ID physicians have gone on to do graduate training in public health and in the various related fields so that they not only have, have, have deep clinical knowledge but they also have a very strong understanding of the health system and how to advocate so that Singapore continues to be safe.